Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, good evening. It gives me a great uh, honor and pleasure to welcome all of you tonight uh, to this new season of the series of Al Furqan lectures on Islamic heritage. Uh, I don't want to mention the time of the COVID, we left it well behind now, but we sort of broke the ice last year with an event. But ever since we never had, uh, never resumed the series of lectures at, uh, in London here. So it's great to be back and we promise you for many more lectures uh, within this series in the next uh, few months, inshallah. We hope that you'll be part of all those uh, lectures. Uh, we have two occasions uh, this year to uh, highlight. Uh, the first one is that we are still uh, remembering and will keep remembering and cherish the memory of our late chairman, uh, His Excellency Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Amani, may he rest in peace. Uh, hence, we uh, every now and again we highlight his main ideas and uh, concepts uh, for which Al Furqan was established initially. Uh, and secondly, we are highlighting this year the 35th anniversary of uh, Al Furqan. Uh, hence, the topics that we're going to tackle this year will be more of a general uh, ideas that pertain uh, very and focusing mainly on the general uh, aspects of the Islamic uh, heritage. Uh, hence the topic of uh, tonight's event as well, uh, the House of Wisdom. As you know, Al Furqan uh, stands uh, uh, for research in the sphere of the Islamic uh, written heritage within the main three spheres. Uh, the uh, Center for the Study of Islamic Manuscripts, the Center for the Mosua or the Encyclopedia of Mecca and Medina, and the St Center for the Study of the Philosophy of Isla Islamic Law, all of the three uh, centers of excellence uh, pertaining to the Islamic uh, written heritage. Uh, hence, one has in mind the first thing that comes uh, to mind are the libraries where such, you know, uh, capital works and uh, uh, you know, uh, handwritten works were kept uh, in those institutions of uh, learning and uh, knowledge. Uh, but uh, before I introduce the title of tonight's lecture, which is in front of you anyway, and our distinguished uh, keynote speaker tonight that is honoring us with, with his uh, presence to start with new series, uh, I would like to invite uh, our chairman, uh, Mr. Sharaf Ahmed Zaki Amani, to welcome you all and uh, say a few words. Uh, please, Sharaf. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Esteemed guests, attendees and friends of the foundation, it is with uh, great honor and excitement that I welcome you all to this lecture as chairman of the Al Furqan Islamic Heritage Foundation and on behalf of the Amani Cultural and Charitable Trust, I am proud to host such an eminent speaker, His Excellency. Professor Ikmaluddin Ihsan Oglu, uh, as you all know, he is an exceptional diplomat, and a, an accomplished scholar, amongst many things, has significantly contributed to understanding how the Islamic heritage has influenced modern science. Uh, he is also one of the main pillars of the Al Furqan Islamic Heritage Foundation, established 35 years ago. Um, in fact, when my Late father, Rahmatullah Ali, uh, founded this foundation. He relied heavily on Professor Ahsan Oglu's advice and guidance. And over the years, he has been an invaluable leader, serving on our board of directors, board of experts, and advisory boards. I proudly call him Uncle Ikmal, and I'm always grateful for his unwavering support and guidance over the years. Now, like the lecturer, the theme of this lecture is of uh, great significance as it sheds light on the House of Wisdom, Beit al-Hikmah. A 9th century Abbasid palace library established in Baghdad for the translation and preservation of Greek, Roman, Indian, Persian works of science, medicine, philosophy and mathematics. The House of uh, Wisdom, as you might all know, later became a hub for scholars and intellectuals worldwide and was instrumental in preserving, transferring, and advancing knowledge from the ancient world. Ulum al Awail. Now, transport yourself back in time. 
Imagine walking through the corridors of the House of Wisdom and the alleyways of Medina to Salam, Baghdad. You would have rubbed shoulders with some of the most brilliant minds of that generation. Scholars like Al-Khawarizmi, Al-Kindi, Thabit ibn Qurra, Al-Farabi, Ibn al-Haytham, and Jabir ibn Hayyan, amongst many, many others. They would have all been there, sharing their ideas and insights and discoveries. Just imagine the exchange of knowledge and intellectual stimulation that would have taken place in that setting. Professor Ihsan Oghla would have fitted nicely amongst those giants. <laughs> but did they really walk the alleyways and the hallways of the House of Wisdom? Or did the house even exist as we understand it today? Was it a fully fledged university with departments? Or was it just a library or a repository, a khizana, housing the private collection of Harun al-Rashid and al-Khalifa al-Ma'moon? These questions do exist today, and our distinguished speaker will help us see and navigate between myth and reality. Now, why is this important? Cities with rich intellectual histories like Baghdad and centers like Beit al-Hikmah have significantly advanced human civilization in various fields. These knowledge centers, for example, from ancient Greece to Alexandria, to Baghdad, to Qurtuba, to Renaissance Italy, to Enlightenment Europe, to more recently Silicon Valley, in California, for example, have fostered intellectual, artistic, scientific, and philosophical innovation. Humanity evolved through the heartbeat of these centers. And by understanding and appreciating the ideas and discoveries that originated from these centers, we can inspire future advancement in the quest for knowledge and understanding. Beit al-Hikmah may serve as a reminder that pursuing and disseminating wisdom surpasses beliefs and transcends cultural boundaries, and its benefits endure for generations to come. And it is with that spirit that the Al-Furqan Islamic Heritage Foundation continues its mission to safeguard and preserve the invaluable legacy of Islamic scholarship. And to further that journey, and while celebrating our 35th anniversary, we will be organizing later this year a symposium uh, titled the, Transli the Translation Movement Between East and West. The symposium will feature academic papers on the transfer of knowledge from three different eras, from Greek, and Sanskrit to Arabic, then from Arabic to Latin and Hebrew, and finally from Latin European languages to Arabic, Ottoman Turkish, and Persian in the pre-modern and early modern eras. Sally and the team will be communicating further details about this event. I just wanted to give you a sneak peek, and I hope to see you all there. In closing, I would like to express my Deep gratitude to our distinguished speaker, His Excellency, Professor Ikmal al-Din Ihsan Oglo. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to you all for attending tonight's lecture and making it a resounding success. And finally, as we <clears throat> stand on the threshold of the month of peace and spirituality, the month of Ramadan, eagerly anticipating the opportunity to enlighten ourselves and rejuvenate our souls. Let us cherish the value of knowledge and wisdom passed down through generations. <laughs> May we continue to draw inspiration from these timeless treasures as we strive towards personal growth and enlightenment. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Sharaf, uh, as mentioned, uh, 
throughout the Islamic, uh, the so-called Islamic civilization, and especially in those the four centuries, the well known as the golden age of Islam or the Islamic civilization, uh, many institutions of learning and knowledge were established. Uh, one can argue that probably the libraries preceded many of the such learning institutions, be it part of uh, palaces, be it part of uh, mosques, be it part of other learning institutions and so on. Among them, uh, you know, personal, uh, private, uh, public libraries and so on. As some historians of libraries put it, uh, they say in such age and time there were libraries, private collection libraries that might have been even bigger than any public libraries that existed elsewhere in the world. Uh, but among all these institutions and uh, these libraries, one that stands out clearly is the House of Wisdom, uh, Beit al-Hikmah, uh, Darul Hikmah, Khizanat al-Hikmah, and so many names used uh, to refer to this uh, library. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of books were written about this, a lot of papers written about this. Uh, some of them probably over-exaggerating the institute itself or the library itself, some of them probably not giving its real value that it played at that uh, time and, and age. Uh, tonight's lecture comes exactly within this uh, uh, frame uh, to deconstruct and um, somewhat, uh, you know, raise probably thought-provoking uh, stand towards this institute. Professor Isanolu uh, recently published a book uh, on this very topic, uh, The House of Wisdom, uh, between myth and reality. As soon as it came out, he told me that it has been published. I couldn't wait to read it. And I thought that's definitely a topic for a lecture. We have to uh, bring that to light and we have to shout it out as to what the reality stands about, uh, stands about this, uh, this library. Uh, so hence, uh, you know, we will be listening to this thought-provoking lecture by a distinguished uh, speaker, His Excellency Professor Kmeledin Ihsanolu. Uh, before I give him the floor, uh, he doesn't need much uh, introduction, but I'm sure, you know, at least for those who will be probably watching the video later on on our YouTube channel. Uh, Professor Isanul is a well-known Turkish scholar and diplomat and a pioneer of studies of Ottoman science and the history of institutions of learning. Uh, he was the founder and chair of the first department of the history of science in, in Turkey at the University of Istanbul. And uh, he was the first director of ISIC as well, one of, the, one of its founders. Um, and the head of the Turkish Society for the History of Science and president of the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science from 2001 to 2005. Uh, he is an editor and co-author of many volumes, uh, one of them the flagship uh, 18 volumes project uh, uh, Osman Bilim Mirasa, in original, the Ottoman Scientific Heritage, a book that uh, he has honored us by giving us the copyright to translate the small version of it in uh, three volumes that was published a uh, couple of months ago in Arabic, and the work is ongoing for the moment. Uh, in the, the translation has been completed now, but in the final stages of editing the book, it will be published soon in English language, a pioneer work that gives an overview about um, the uh, scientific heritage that was produced mainly during the so-called Ottoman uh, uh, era. Uh, he, has, uh, he has been laureate of many uh, medals, among them the Alexander Koyra Medal and also the Kuwait uh, Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences prestigious, prestigious award in the field of Arabic and Islamic heritage. Of course, uh, as Al-Furqan, we take pride with the fact that he is one of the founders of Al-Furqan and uh, he honors us with his uh, being a member of the board of uh, directors of uh, Al-Furqan. Uh, we are honored to have him among us uh, tonight. We thank him for his time and we uh, please join me in uh, inviting him to the floor, to the podium, to uh, tell us a bit more about the House of Wisdom. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And the it's in your Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start my talk paying homage to the founder and the patron of Al Furkan Foundation. Working with him was an honor and delight, and I witnessed how sincere, how devoted he was to the cause of Furkan. 
I'm glad today to see that his family carrying on the flag and keeping his tradition, his line of movement of public service alive. The House of Wisdom is the most celebrated institution of learning in history of Islamic civilization. There are so many studies, so are many books, many thesis dissertations made on this subject, and many books in different languages written, authored, translated about this institution. But our knowledge about this institution comes mainly from one book, and Nadim's Fehrist. The oldest accounts on Bayt al-Hikmah as mentioned, are mentioned in Nadim's Fehrist. And Nadim's Fehrist is a book which is a record of the intellectual activities in the Abbasid, early Abbasid period. The, there is many editions of Nadim's Fehrist, but I have to confess that the edition made by, published by Al-Furqan is the best. Not because of any reason, but it was well done and uh, drawn on the previous uh, editions and made use of different available manuscripts and have many indices which helps you research this big subject. So our, our knowledge comes from a Nadim who died in 1990 and that was 20, 200 years after Harun al-Rashid and al-Ma'mun's time because this Bayt al is a as a library was a palace library, royal library in the in the palace where Harun al-Rashid and al-Mamun. There are many records of this period, but none of them mention Bayt al-Hikmah. It's only al Nadims who mention Bayt al-Hikmah. And in the two, in the four volumes published by al-Furqan on al Nadim's Fehris, there are only 15, 15, one, five, accounts on Bayt al-Hikmah, or related to Bayt al-Hikmah. These accounts are under three categories. The word Bayt al-Hikmah, House of Wisdom, there are seven. Khizana al-Hikmah, Khizana, the repository of Hikmah, of wisdom. Four accounts. And the third accounts under the name of Khizana al-Ma'mun, the library of al-Ma'mun. So, we have to keep this in mind and also to keep in mind that there are some references. A repetition of what, what Nadim has mentioned in his book or adding few lines, few sentences to what he has already mentioned. I will come back to this, but to see what I have here, three examples. Three examples. This is two examples here. The first is Arabic text from Nadim's, and this is English translation from Dodge. Those who know Nadim's book, there is an English translation of it, Dodge. So when you read the first line, this is about Said ibn Huraym al Katib. And Nadim's about him says he was an associate of Sahl ibn Harun in Bayt al-Hikmah. He was eloquent, a master of literary style, etc., etc., information on Sa'id bin Huran. What interests us here that Nadim says that Sa'id ibn Huran was in Bayt al-Hikmah associate of Sahl ibn Harun. So here we have an institution called Bayt al-Hikmah, clear. The second reference on a, on a scholar called Salm, 
And he says in Arabic text, Sahib Bayt al-Hikmah, Ma'a Sahl ibn Harun. That he was the director of Bayt al-Hikmah with Sahl bin Harun. Then next slide. On Sahl ibn Harun, وهو سهل ابن هارون ابن رهيون كذا كذا انتقل إلى البصرة وكان متحققا بخدمة المأمون وصاحب خزانة الحكمة. Here he mentioned the same library under the name خزانة الحكمة. First it was بيت حكمة here it is خزانة الحكمة. He was سهل ابن هارون ابن كذا who after going to البصرة became dedicated to the service of the Caliph المأمون. He was director of Khizanat al-Hikmah as well as scholar, etc. So here we have the same mention about this library and two different appellations. First, Bayt al-Hikmah, the other is Khizanat al-Hikmah. The third example I'm giving here on Kitab al-Majesty, Book of Al-Majest, Ptolemy's book, famous book on uh, astronomy. He speaks about this book and he says, هذا الكتاب ثلاثة عشر مقالة وأول من اعتنى بتفسير وخرج به يحيى بن خالد بن برمك ففسره له جماعة. He says that this book, Al Majest, comprises thirteen sections. The first person to become interested in translating it and issuing it in Arabic was يحيى بن خالد بن برمك. يحيى بن خالد بن برمك was the Wazir of Harun al-Rashid, Wazir of Harun al-Rashid, from Persian origin, among the Persian Sassanid bureaucracy that served the Abbasid Caliphs. So, this is only three or four examples. There are for 15, not more than that. But for out of these 15, and few examples, few, few sentences more in Ibn Juljul, Ibn Abi Usaybi'a, Ibn al Kufti. There are biographical dictionaries written after this time of Harun al Rashid, 200 to 400 years after that. And then all of a sudden we find great works, big, great, in not in appreciation of the greatness, but of uh, sheer volume. For instance, here, examples of some books exclusively decided. The first book, 500 pages on, the, on Bayt al-Hikmah, 500 pages. And it claims to be a PhD. The second book, is two volumes on the same subject, an international symposium on Bayt al-Hikmah, where around 70 articles contributed by 70 scholars published in two big volumes, 1,000, uh, more than 1,300 pages. From where they brought all this knowledge, I really don't know, but this is the case. We'll come to that. Then I just giving you two examples from books in English. The first one is Jonathan Leon's The House of Wisdom, How the Arabs Transformed Western Civilization. The second book is a very famous book, House of Wisdom, How Arabic Science Saved the Ancient Knowledge and Gave Us the Renaissance by Professor Jim Al Khalidi. Having mentioned this now, let us see how we can study uh, properly and correctly, objectively, the history of, the, of Bayt al-Hikmah. First of all, we have to study it in the context, social, cultural context of Baghdad, 19th, 9th century. Our population, interest of population, Arabic culture coming from Arabia, Persian culture coming from Iran, Indian culture coming from India, and of course the Greek influence, etc., etc. And then the development of Shiism and uh, Sunnism, etc., etc., 
all these aspects has to be put in context. Now, to study also Dar Beit uh, al-Hikmah, we have to be uh, aware of the development of institutions. How can you see or read in 9th century library European Academy of Sciences belongs to the 19th century? That is very strange. Now, how this myth, which I call myth, of Beit al-Hikmah developed in scholarship through generations? The first interest or the first issue, first um, problem related to Beit al-Hikmah came in a translation of a 16th, 17th century bibliography, famous bibliography of, of Katib Chalabi, Haj Khalifa, where he mentions Salm, the one we just uh, Salm. You can read the English. He was the director of Beit al-Hikmah with Sahl ibn Harun, who made translation from Persian in time. In, in Arabic, Sahib Beit al-Hikmah. German, German orientalist Flugel translated this Sahib Beit al-Hikmah as the author of a book called Dar Beit al-Hikmah. Author of a book. Sahib, Sahib Kitab. Author of a book. But he immediately, not immediately, after a few years, when he published uh, Nadim's book, he corrected this. He said, I'm sorry, I took it as author. He's not an author, he is the director of. Uh, afterwards, after Flugel, a Mo Moravian orientalist in the name of Moritz Steinschneider, in his leading study about Arabic translations from Greek books, refers to a frugal mistake which follows suit in Sutter's work and confirms the information provided by Al-Kufti and Katib Chalabi about Sam and translations made by him. However, Stein Schneider, who are referring to Bayt al-Hikmah as an institute of sciences. In, institute now, the Bayt al-Hikmah became in European language Institute of Sciences. Few years after this, famous Karl Brockelmann, in his study, famous study, Geschichte der Arabischen Literatur, he mentions Beit al Hikmah as an active institution of scientific pursuit. An active institute of scientific pursuit, including a library. Here comes the imagination of a new, of a new uh, picture of the Beitul Hikmah. The library observatory, headed by Salm, who was practicing as translator from Persian to Arabic. The editions, different editions of Karl Brockelmann's book came through and in the first edition was in, 19, in 1898, 1898. And this, then in 1937 edition, he says that Al, in Baghdad, al Ma'mun founded Beit al-Hikmah with also hosted library and observatory. So here you have a diff more getting towards definite and precise information which is not existing in the 15 account I mentioned here. But this is all from imagination of the orientalists who studied this. 
And it's, uh, he says, founded by Al Ma'mun. So he gives a clear. Uh, here, we find that Brockerman, in describing Dar Beit al Hikmah, was under the influence of the Russian, the German Academy of Sciences in Berlin, how big it was, etc. So he wanted to see that there was an equivalent 10 centuries ago in Baghdad. Then, after in the, in the first, second decade of the 20th century, a Palestinian young man who was educated in Palestine in American schools went to Columbia University to make PhD on the subject. And that was the first dissertation that we know on the subject of Beit al-Hikmah. His name is Khalil Tota. He studies the Beit al-Hikmah in, in light of the available information. And he concludes his thesis by saying, and I quote him, in conclusion, the House of Wisdom appears to have being the University of Baghdad, immediately, have been, appears to have been the University of Baghdad with its distinguished performance, library and observatory. Observatory became part of the Beit al -Hikmah. It may justly claim the honor of having been the first university of both the medieval and the modern world, for it bore the torch aloft long before Bologna, Paris, Prague, Prague, Oxford, and Cambridge. Sorry, Dr. Nizam. <laughs> so this is very clear-cut identification of the new image of Beit al-Hikmah, which was just a library plus few things more. In, in the 30s of last century, we find that there is interest in Beit al-Hikmah and many publications touch on this. But there is a publication made by a German scholar, if to of Thermologist living in Cairo, called Max Meyerhoff. He was interested in history of of medicine in Islam and he published Kitab al-Ashar Maqalat fil Ayn, 10 articles on the eye by Hunayn ibn Ishaq. And he, Meyerhoff, in his study says, and I quote, the caliph who appointed Hunayn ibn Ishaq as a kind of superintendent to his library dash academy, which he founded in Baghdad in 830 under the name of Beit al Hikmah. A staff of young translators were employed in this institution and making translation from Greek and Syriac to Arabic. So here you have a library, you have an academy where library, observatories, and then also what has been called Bureau of Translation, Office of Translation in some writings, school of translation. Later, the same Meyerhoff, in a famous article called From Alexandria to Baghdad, like Hollywood film, From Alexandria to Baghdad, very influential uh, article, and he says, in pursuance of his policy, Al Ma'mun in 830 established his famous Beit al Hikmah in Baghdad. A combination of library, academy, translation bureau, which is in many aspects proved to be the most important educational institutions since the foundation of Alexandria Museum 
in the first half of the third century. So here he makes relation, builds a relation between the Alexandrian Museum or Biblioteca Alexandrina and the Beit al Hikmah without making any, giving any <coughs> proof, any indication, any, uh, any, any record on that, just his own imagination. So we are progressing with the image of uh, Darul Hikmah. Then you have a, a Syrian scholar called Yusuf al-Aish. Yusuf al-Aish was a young scholar who has been sent to Sorbonne to make a PhD on the history of libraries, public and semi-public libraries in the Arab world. And he, that study is really very important. I disagree with his findings, results, but I appreciate very much that he exhausted the sources, the primary sources. Almost he left nothing for others to find in classic sources. And he says in the end of his book study, it seems to us, as we have shown with sufficient reports and facts, that Bayt al-Hikmah was established according to Arabs conception of this type of ancient institutions, Arab concept of this institution. Where, where is this conception is? It's, there is no conception. But he says, it seems to us that this according to Arab conception. It, its founders and patrons took care to collect the works of ancient scholars, have them translated commented and summarized, they engaged the astrologers who were equipped with instruments and probably worked in observatories and brought together scholars and staff to deliberate and study these books and engage in debates. The Caliph provided lodging for those who worked here. We believe that we can now define Bayt al-Hikmah in its developed form as a quasi-public institution comprises a set of branches with the aim of developing scientific activities, etc. So, we have further steps towards building up a different institution. Then comes the great PhD thesis. Here, the one on the left. The concoction of the House of Wisdom's false image reached its peak with a book more than 500 pages, devoted to totally to its history. The author of the book claims that it was a doctoral dissertation, without clearly mentioning where he defended this compilation, an array of gross errors which unfortunately escaped the attention of academic critics. The book represents detailed information on various activities of this academy, public library, translation center, and give attention, the first Islamic university. Here we have the first Islamic university. And this Islamic university includes curriculum of different departments of the university, mathematical and natural science, furnished with elaborate style, payroll of faculty members, stipends for the students, and their dormitories are all presented. List of books translated from different times are listed. The commencement ceremony are also discussed in details with reference to the academic dress of worn by the professors teaching stuff. 
The innocent 9th century palace library of the Abbasid Caliph thus acquired this final image at the end of the 20th century. The publication of this so-called dissertation helped a lot of dis dissemination of the image of the very sophisticated, very uh, organic, great institution of learning called Beit al-Hikmah. And we have many followers of this. The last episode or the more important episode in the building up of this false image was organization of an international conference on 1200 anniversary of the establishment of the Abbasid Beit al-Hikmah, organized in Baghdad 2001, just two years before the occupation of Baghdad. The speeches and papers presented, there are 71 papers, two big volumes, 1,300 pages. So in the pages, in the papers and speeches presented at the symposium, once again registered the invented story and image of Beit Hikmah with additional undocumented wild exaggeration to the extent of claiming that and I quote, Beit al-Hikmah had roots that go deep in history, that is to say in the heritage of ancient Iraq from the days of the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. All the way. All the way to Assyrians, Kildanis, Sumerians, etc. It was also very nice to hear the, the representative of UNESCO in that meeting in Baghdad, the representative of UNESCO director general. He had speech at the inauguration, paying tribute to the Abbasid institution, generously identified Beit al Hikmah with UNESCO. Very nice by taking liberty of saying, accordingly, I would say UNESCO would have been established here in Baghdad in the 9th century. <laughs> it is also worth mentioning that the papers submitted to this international ceremonial meeting were published in two big volumes. This is two big, one, the first volume. Now, we have many references to many English books. Among them, these two I have chosen, Jonathan Lyons. This is books for public reader, and they are useful ones, and they are searched ones. But the part on Beit al-Hikmah was under the influence of this image. Particularly the book of Professor Jim al-Halili is is, this book is lively, engaging, and fascinating style mentions on, Dar on Beit al-Hikmah. He says, far more likely, in my view, is that the library or the repository of books, Khazina, that was set up by the early caliphs, was indeed distinct from Al-Mamun's academy and that the medieval Arabic historians know this. We haven't seen any historian, Arabic historian says, this, there's, there was an academy and the academy was different from the library. But anyhow, he didn't go too far to extend it to the Sumerians and Akkadians, etc., etc. Now, this is how the myth was built and developed. Let me try now with you to dissect the myth. Uh, in dissecting the myth, one really needs to carefully examine the records, the accounts, and the historical reference, which I mentioned. al Nadim, Ibn al Kofti, Ibn Juljul, Ibn Abi Usaybi'ah, etc. And the Hebrew 
İbn el Ibri known as Bar Hibarus. As I said in the very beginning, beginning these libraries are mentioned under under three names: Baytul Hikma, Khizanatul Hikma, and Khizanatul Mamun. And Nadim, when he speaks about this, very careful, he uses Khizanat al Hikma and Bayt al Hikma alternatively, equal to each other. But when he speaks about this library after the death of Al Ma'mun, he says Khizanat al Ma'mun. Very interesting, deliberately chosen words, Khizanat al Ma'mun. He doesn't say Bayt al Hikma. So we understand from him that Bayt al Hikma as a palliation of the royal palace was to denote certain type of library and engagement of the library or special uh, connect, co collection for in the library. <laughs> and we, there are many examples explaining this in details. I don't want to spend time for that. But for instance, there are four accounts in Nadim's Fehrist with relates to books, to personal experience of him and Nadim's personal experience. His experience with books belonging to the library. And he says that I saw this book and I took note from the, from Khizat al Ma'mun because he lived after the Ma'mun and etc. These expressions, when also considered with the statement of Ibn Abi Usaybi'ah, that he was, the, he saw books carrying the sign of Al Ma'mun Library, suggests that 400 years after the death of Al Ma'mun, books belonging to his library were changing hands. It has the sign of the library. So here we are clear that there is only one institution with different three names. My second point for dissecting this myth, the reference made by new authors on translation activities in Beit al Hikmah, that there was, Hunayn ibn Ishaq was in charge of translation officially by the caliph etc and there are different references to that but luckily we have a long list of Hunayn's books either edited or corrected or translated either from Arami from from <coughs> Syrian or from Greek Syriac or Greek and, and this is well published by a German orientalist Ragester. And when you read the long list of Hunayn's books, you don't find any reference to Beit al-Hakmah, House of Israel. There are many references to people who asked for translation, paid for translation. And they are either scholars, physicians in the Bimaristan, or uh, bibliophiles who have big libraries imitating, emulating the Caliph's library. But he doesn't mention that I did this translation for Bayt al Hikmah. He doesn't say that. He says, I did this translation in the time of Caliph. Al-Mutawakkil, or Al-Wasiq, etc. He does in his time, not for him, difference. So here we have a problem, but to understand the nature of translation movement, there is a account in Al-Kufti, Al-Kufti passed away in 1248, a little bit late. In his biography of Hunayn ibn Ishaq, 
Al-Kufti narrates that he, Hunayn bin Ishaq, sat down among the translators to translate Greek books. He say, Qa'ada, Qa'ada, Qa'ada bayn al-Mutarjimin, means he sat among them. There was a place where they sit, and he, as the master, will sit among them, Qa'ada bayn al-Mutarjimin. This, this is the only reference we have. Qa'ada bayn al-Mutarjimin. So it means that there is a way that they were sitting somewhere. But of course, we have no proof to say that they were doing translation in the in the library, either called it Beit al-Hikmah or Khizan al-Hikmah. There's no record on that. But this doesn't mean that some of them were there using the library, as we do today, using the library. Anyhow, that is doesn't mean that there was a school of translation, doesn't mean that there was a bureau of translation. Of course there was translation, a very important translation. We know about that, and it had happened in the time of Ab early Abbasid time, particularly Ma'mun time, Harun Rashid time. This is, nobody can deny this. But the, the, that this was done in the building of the, of Beit al that is the question. Now coming to the story, funny story that Dar al Beit al Hikmah was a university. In 15 account mentioned in Ibn Nadim, there is no single reference to teaching, quote unquote. For teaching, the only quote we have is Ibn, Ibn Kufti when he, when he speaks about the death of Musa bin Shakir. Musa bin Shakir was a great astronomer during the Mamun's time. When he passed away, Al Mamun asked. Yahya bin Mansur, one of his prominent astrologers, to take care of these three boys. Musa bin Shakir had three boys, genius, Banu Musa, famous Banu Musa. And Al Mamun wanted them to be educated in sciences. He asked one of his people to educate, fi bayt al -hikma. The word here used by Al-Kufti that Al Mamun Athbatahum fi Bayt al Yani, what it does mean? They, Al Mamun, fixed them, or rather placed them in Bayt al to have teaching from certain body. So we have teaching, yes, and this is the only example we have, but doesn't mean that it was a school. It was a teaching classes. A teaching was from master to disciple, as usual, no institution. So out of this innocent, very innocent sentence, you built a big university with so many faculties and you built the payroll, you, that is very strange. That is very strange. And this didn't catch the attention of, of critic, academic critics, very strange. Now, part of the dissecting the myth is to search for the meaning of library or the word library in Arabic. <laughs> in Arabic, there is, in classic Arabic before Islam, there is no word for library because I think there were no libraries. Books were very rare, and paper was not introduced yet. Paper was into, paper was introduced in 850, after the Battle of Talas in today's of uh, Kazakhstan between Muslim army and the Chinese. They captured manufacturers of paper and they brought them to Samarkand, and from Samarkand to Baghdad in early Abbasid time, and that made 
the uh, production of books many very easy and help spreading learning among the interested people in Baghdad and of course the entourage of the king of the of the caliph uh, so in, in these early days when it is there was mention of books they will say Beitun bihi kutub, a house which has books in it. The first, first appellation for a library is Khizana. Khizana means a closet, a reservatory, place to keep things. And it was Khizana al Kutub, repository of books. When these books were focused on al-hikmah hikmah means wisdom of course but it has another meaning books of ancients as mentioned by our chairman which belongs to pre-islamic pre-arabic sciences like medicine like astronomy mathematics philosophy etc etc this was called ulum al awal the ancients, the people who came before us a while. The libraries expanded and those who were focusing on Hikmah, Ulum al Hikmah, called Khizanat Kutub al Hikmah, the repository of books on Hikmah. And this was shortened to Khizanat al Hikmah. So when a Nadim uses Khizana and Beit alternatively, he means that a certain phase it was smaller and when it became bigger, Beit al-Hikmah, which has more than one room. So comes the, the appellation Beit al-Hikmah, Khizana al-Hikmah, or Khizanat al-Kutub, etc. Now there is a claim that these words or these expressions were translated from Greek to Arabic. And those who propose that these words translated from Greek to Arabic give no proof. Luckily, there is a dictionary of 9th century Greek Arabic translations, Greek Arabic translations by a famous German scholar, Ullmann, Manfred Ullmann, where he collected all terms that translated from Greek to Arabic. He doesn't mention this Khizanat al-Kutub or Bayt al-Hikmah. He doesn't mention. This means it was not done. He mentioned, for instance, biblioteca is the Latin, the Greek word for library. Biblioteca, the place where books are kept, reservatory. He, the suffix teka is mentioned in different places. For instance, a place for grain. It is used. A place for other things, it is used. But there's no use of biblioteca or khizanat al kutub, nothing to do with translation. So if we agree that the, the word library, the Arabic word for library was newly invented, how you call the library of the caliph? If your library is khizanat al kutub or my library is khizanat al hikmah, what would be his majesty's? library. As I mentioned, Beit means wider place, uh, is formed of different parts, and there is no way that we can mention that this is one of the proofs I give for the first time in this study 
to show that this term of Beit al-Hikmah was a development in Arabic language that has no parallel in Greek or in Persian. A famous Kalila Udimna by Ibn Mukaffa. Ibn Mukaffa, in his introduction to the book, he speaks about the repositories of books of Indian kings, Khazain Muluk al Hind. He used Khazain al Qutub. And this was written before, long time before Al Ma'mun, and this uh, terminology was created. Later, Al Khalila Udimna, when published by De Sassi, a French scholar, for the first time printed, he introduced, he added to the old copy an introduction written on the 12th century, where the word Bayt al Hikmah is used. 12th century, Bayt al Hikmah is used. And this is proof that already Bayt al Hikmah, as, as, a, as an appellation for a royal library, is accepted and is in use. Professor um, uh, Gutas, in his book, Greek Thought and Arabic Culture, he maintains that the library, the Beit al Hikmah library, is of Sassanid origin. And that is, Beit al Hikmah is a translation of a Sassanid, of a Pahlavi word. In, in, in, I really looked at this matter carefully. I, I don't know, of course, Pahlavi, but I asked authorities of Pahlavi language if there is a word for Beit al Hikmah in Persian. And I found no answer. They said, we don't know. The text available doesn't tell us anything about this. And later he published another paper, which I also doesn't mean that exactly. I found that Persians themselves, they use Beit al-Hikmah, Hanayi Hikmah, Hanayi Hikmah means, Hana means Beit, house of wisdom. Again, they use the Arabic term. They don't have special term for this. So we can clearly say that it is an Arabic development of an institution of big library devoted to Hikmah books, non-Arabic, non-Islamic books. So if, if Beit al-Hikmah was not this and that, what it was? Again, Carefully studying the text uh, at hand, and studying some more texts, primary sources. We have two important sources. One by Arab philologist Al Asma'i, who passed away in 828 before Ibn Nadim. He says, he narrates that, and I quote him, it was the habit of the Imam, Caliph Harun al-Rashid, when he feels spirited and lively to call me to narrate to him the chronicles of past nations and begone centuries. It happened that as I was narrating to him one night, he asked me, al Asmai. Where are, where are the former kings and their sons? I answered him by saying, Prince of the faithful, Amir al muminin they have gone to their destiny. At this point, the caliph raised his hands towards the sky and said, O annihilator of kings, have mercy on me when you join me to them. Then called 
Saleh, the keeper of his prayer, and told him, go to the director of the house of wisdom. Go to the director of the house of wisdom. And ask him to fetch the book, Seer al Miluk, Biographies of Kings, and bring it. The director brought the book. The caliph asked Al Asma'i to read, etc., etc. This means what? This means the library was connected to palace. And there's already a Sahib, Bayt al Hikmah director. And the caliph used to hear, to listen to books read to him, etc. So this is very clear. Second one, second report, which is interesting. It is narrated by al Jahis, who passed away 869. He says that al Hassan ibn Sahl ibn Nawabakht told him, and this gentleman died in 880 and 51. He says that the Caliph al-Mamun, here al-Mamun, before that, Asma'i, it was Harun al-Rashid. Now it is his son, Khalifa al-Mamun. Once asked, which of the books of by Arabs is the noblest? I said, al-Mubtada. He said, no. I said, then it's the book of history. He again said, no. Then he paused and said that it is the book of the interpretation of the Quran. Because the Quran is immutable, immaculate, and its interpretation is immaculate too. Then, then he asked, which of the books by non-Arabs, Al-Ajam, is the noblest among them. I cited many books. But he said, no. It is the book of Jawidan Khirad, Mortal Wisdom, is the noblest among them. At this point, he asked me for the catalog of non-Arab books. Catalog. This means there is a catalog here of this library. At this point, he asked me for a catalog of non-Arab books, but he did not find the catalog came from the Bayt al-Hikmah. And he looked to the catalog, looking for his head, he didn't find And then it goes uh, to that extent. So it is clear that this is well-organized library, big collection, and the caliphs Harun al-Rashid and his son Mamun were very interested. But it doesn't give us too much about how the library was organized. But parallel to it, we have a description of a library in Shiraz of Adud al-Dawla al-Buwayhi, Buwid, ruler of Fars. He, al-Muqaddisi, who died 991, contemporary to Ibn Nadim, he says, for this library of Shiraz. There is a manager, manager, a librarian and a supervisor from among the people of good repute in the town to be a keeper of the library. And there was not a book written up to that time of all various sciences, but happened to be there. It consists of long oblong gallery in a large hall with rooms on every side. He attached to all the walls of the gallery and rooms bookcases six feet in height and three cubits long, made of wood and decorated. For every subject there are bookcases and catalogues. For every subject, there are bookcases. They are separate with catalogs. This is parallel to Beit Then there is another one relates to Avicenna, Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina, a library established in Samanid time in Buhara. He says, 
a building with many rooms in each of which were chests of books opposite each other in one room. There were books in Arabic language and poetry in other jurisprudence and each room was similarly dedicated to a single science. So this also gives us a hint to how it was. Well, we have, we dismiss the idea or the proposal that Beit al-Hikmah was organized according to Greek origin or Persian origin. For Persian origin, as I said, there is no evidence, but we have unequaled reference about the Akhlaq al-Muluk, deportment of kings, where there is a book translated shows how the king, says the king, is served with books and the secrecy that even if he read Quran, nobody should know which verse he read. And the books were wrapped in certain way and, and speaks on absolute secrecy. And that reminds me of what happened to the controversy made about Al-Ma'mun because Al-Ma'mun was supporting Mu'tazila in the issue of createdness of Quran and that the population were against Mu'tazila and then of course the Sunni, particularly the Hanbali uh, leader was against it and that created the controversy in the, in the, in the Abbasid uh, society. So here, in this book, it says that nobody should know what the Caliph has read, even if it was a, a Quran. If we look to the impact of this House of Wisdom, what was the impact? The impact was, of course, encouraging scholars, patronizing them, and helping them in writing important books. Patronage was the main institution or the main way of advancing sciences and literature. And of course, we know that it was Harun al-Rashid, his son al-Mamun, and the following uh, Abbasid caliphs did this. We have no problem with that. The problem is, is all this activities were under the roof of Beit al-Hikmah or not. In many books like this, you, see, you find that yes, all of them are attributed to al-Mamun, to Harun rashid and that they were done under the roof of Beit al-Hikmah. We have no single reference to this. Of course it is done in Mamun, etc., etc., but it's not in Beit al-Hikmah. This is one important issue. The second issue is relating to <coughs> what happened to Dar al Bayt al Hikmah. We know that Al Mamun created Al Mahna, where he persecuted those who did not believe in the createdness of Quran, Khalq al-Quran. And that was uh, created a dichotomy in the society, people supporting people, opponent. And this is the first time that we have a fighting between factions in the Islamic culture. And I think it has its long bad effect until even today that is one thing. But the other thing that encouragement of Ulum al Awail went on. And this mihna, this uh, ordeal 
or persecution did not hamper the translation movement. This is proved by Professor Gutas. And I also add to it one thing that it did not affect the study of pre-Islamic sciences or Ulum al-Awail because the, we have many examples Al-Fatih ibn Khaqan, Ali al-Munajjim and many others, Banu Musa, they all had their big libraries big libraries full of books on Hikmah and there was during the Mutawakkil who stopped Mihna and all through the years of, with Mihna or outside of Mihna their activities were not challenged or not persecuted. So in the Inquisition, Inquisition policy and the persecution of opponents of the createdness of Quran continued during the reign of four caliphs, al mamun al mutasim Al-Wasiq, and the first years of Al-Mutawakkil. The struggle against this policy was led by Ahmed ibn Hanbal and come to an end by the decision of Al-Mutawakkil in 850 to stop this. Thus the supremacy of Al-Mu'tazila ended and their political power never recovered. To wrap up what I have been saying, I have to say that the main difficulty in comprehending the nature of Abbasid Palace Library, at times referred to as Khizat al-Hikmah or Bayt al-Hikmah, the difficulty is how to situate this library within the overall framework of multifaceted cultural activities in the era of both the Caliphs Harun al-Rashid and al-Mamun. What is certain about these activities is that they were in the main held under the Caliph's patronage. Indeed, the poets, literary figures, religious scholars, physicians, astronomers and astrologers who belonged to different religions and hailed from varied origins exercised their activities under the patronage of the Caliph and with his financial support. Naturally, there was a greater, larger scope of patronage based at the court among the patrons where the Caliph's men, worthy scholars and rich people who were interested in various elements of cultural activities. It is obvious that Bayt al-Hikmah was administered by a director, Sahib Bayt al-Hikmah. And Nadim confirms this and gives the name of Salam in Harun al Rashid's time and Sahl ibn Harun, who under his, this, undertook this post during the Mamun's reign. From an Nadim's Fahris and other biograph, biographical sources, it could easily be maintained that the functions of the director were more than a librarian and his functions were not limited to collecting, copying, and preserving books, but included, uh, included translation and supervising of translation books. This study has shown that generations of scholars in the modern time addressing the history of, out, the, history of the House of Wisdom overlooked historical context and they were reading more about modern institutions in classical texts, idealizing their structure and function in a way that reflected their own ambitions. And these ambitions might be nationalistic ambition or professional ambitions that you are a member of academy or you want to, or you want to be a member of academy, you read the 9th century text academy, or you are aspiring for uh, national interest in the 20s and 30s of last century 
So you want to see that in your in your past there was a glory, glorious past. They have very advanced institutions, which he was first getting to know in his days. Of course, the catalog of uh, the the Fehris of Nadim was not a catalog of the big library of palace library. It was a survey of the early Abbasid cultural activities. So it's one again of the mistakes of the interpretation to present the Alfaris as a catalog. So this is dissecting the myths. And I hope that the myths surrounding the house of wisdom can no longer stand in the face of reality. If this happens, I will be very happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. <clears throat> May I kindly ask you to bear with us if you can, for, or probably okay, you, you could sit. Uh, uh, we are running a bit late, but we'll try to wrap up within 15 minutes, hopefully. So whoever will take the mic, uh, please keep it brief, straight to the point, and connect you to the topic. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for the interesting, insightful, and thought-provoking lecture. Uh, so I see one there, Dr. Nabil, and the third one probably will take another round if you manage to do it quickly and then probably I'll take the right at the end if I find so we'll, within 15 minutes we'll try to wrap it up please. Uh, may I start with uh, the gentleman over there? If you can you just uh, introduce yourself yes. for the video recording. So that, Thank uh, you. Thank you. My name is Mohanad uh, Hajali. I'm uh, a senior fellow at Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. Um, thank you for this lecture really uh, you know um, brilliant facts and uh, kind of a dissection of uh, of that history in Ibn Nadim and, and the various uh, works of historians back in the day. <clears throat> but, um, you know, the House of Wisdom and the story of the House of Wisdom also is a, is a national myth for many of us in the region. Um, specifically, you know, the burning of the House of Wisdom and, and the impact that that had on the Arab nationalist fervor and all of that. So I just wanted to ask whether you found any political context when you're looking at the um, you know, the later histories of of the House of Wisdom and that creation of the myth with its, you know, various details, whether you found any political context in terms of, you know, these, um, you know, nationalist, uh, Arab nationalist uh, historians uh, attempting to create that myth for, you know, for political reasons, especially that you were talking about the early 20th century um, and, and that uh, dissertation that you spoke about early on. Thank you. Well, the, yes, of course, the first dissertation by Tota in Columbia University is expression of, of Arab nationalism. Philippe Hattie's book also, which became the reference book on the Arab world, he also, speaking about the Mamun's time, mentioned this with Arabic aspiration. The, very important thesis of uh, Yusuf al Aish at Sorbonne, his toward the Bibliothek Arab, it is again aspiration, national aspiration, and many others. So this is true. The book, the two, vo many books printed in Baghdad in the anniversary, apart from this Congress, International Congress, many books written in the same way. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Dr. Nabil Haidawi, President of ICT, uh, lecturer and writer. Beit uh, al-Hikmah, this book which uh, I gave you, Abu al-Ala al-Marwi, I'm speaking about uh, Baghdad and Abbasid era. Al-Marwi, when he came to Baghdad, he was examined in Baghdad. How he was examined, uh, they bring him to Beit al-Hikmah and they choose uh, many books and they ask him about these books. So usually any scholar come from outside Baghdad and uh, uh, want to take position there, they try to uh, uh, examine him. So your lecture was brilliant, honestly, who, and you who give... Who mentioned this? Uh, uh, who mentioned the, it? The uh, there are many references in the book, you will see it. 
okay. and not one or two or three. So I there mean, are two I books. Mean, how, how authentic is this account? Uh, uh, I think Ibn Nadim, one of them, and there are others. There are authentic, some uh, no, references. No, Abu Ala al Ma'ari, long after Ibn Nadim. No, no, no, no. Uh, not Ibn Nadim. Uh, uh, I think there are some references. I, uh, and uh, the second issue you mentioned Al Mu'tazila. This is a great point. So I, the, you know, they have five pillars. I want you to evaluate. How do you see Al Mu'tazila? And thank you very much for your excellent lecture. Well, uh, I am not uh, the best an the best man to answer this question because. Uh, my knowledge and my study to al Mu'tazila is a secondary interest. My main interest in the institutions, history of institutions of learning. But I, as I mentioned, it was first time that the Caliph, the King, forces a certain opinion, religious opinion, on others and his people and punishes the ulama or the scholars who refute, refuse his point of view. This is the first time in the Islamic history. And this created the rupture and created uh, um, resistance uh, until Ibn Hanbal was successful, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. So this is in shell not the, of course, the createdness of the Quran was there because it helps the Caliph to uh, have uh, his say in the, it is not eternal, that the Quran was not eternal. So he as Khalifatullah can has certain authority on the text as well on to the contrary of if it is not created that it was eternal, this means that he has no power on it. That was the key point in the, the or in the in the fight between mo those who believed in created Khalq al Quran or on the contrary. Yes, sir. Next question, please. please. Um, my name is Esan <coughs> Masood. I'm a, a science editor with uh, Nature. Uh, Professor Sinoglu, thank you for your for your lecture and um, thank you also for not including my book in the Hall of Shame. Uh, <laughs> and thank you also for completely deflating our collective sense that we you know the Islamic civilization had this institution and that it invented universities and observatories and God knows what I feel like the with sort of collective sense of depression. But my more sort of serious uh, question is um, about sources. And is there nothing in the translations of um, Khwarizmi or is there nothing in the descriptions of Mahmud's scientific expeditions which makes any reference to the House of Wisdom? Well, I didn't find any. I'm sorry for that. Uh, for instance, we have a detailed account on Ishaq ibn Hunayn. And he, for instance, mentioned that during the campaign, they were in a campaign, military campaign with, during Mahmoud's time. So during the campaign, the army is fighting and he and his people around him working on translations. So to that extent, we have some information. But on the other side, we don't have information. So, uh, we are all, of course, changing views on subjects a very difficult time because it has been for so many years, a century, that everything was done in Beit al-Hikmah and uh, now you come and say, no, it is not Dar al-Hikmah. Maybe yes, but not all of them. For instance, there is a, a very important account by uh, different biographies, biographical dictionaries on on a scholar who Mamun want to him to write a book, certain book. Mm -hmm. So the sources says that he gave him a place to study, he patrons them, he gave him a, a, a 
a slave to serve, a, a, a script to write, a slave to serve, and a jariya to run the house. So to that extent we have information, but it doesn't say in Bayt al-Hikmah or in the palace, or maybe it is, we don't know about the uh, Abbasid palaces too much. Uh, there is Qasr al-Khuld, there is other palaces. Of course it has to be near the palace, maybe part of the palace or annexed to the palace, but of course it is not an independent institution. Like they write nowadays uh, institutions with budgets and uh, board of directors and things like that. Sorry, just one. Sorry, Sorry if I can. Um, I have the microphone. Sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, thank, thank you, sir, for, for your lecture. My name is Mahmoud Al Abbasi. Um, I'm a news editor, but I'm here on the capacity of being an Abbasid. Um, um, you're totally right about the um, the uh, the way that um, a lot of wrong things were attributed to the House of Wisdom uh, as a name. But my fear is that, um, as you point out, those inaccuracies. People would uh, go in for the back door and try to uh, claim that the whole great role of, uh, of civilization or of translation that were directly sanctioned by the Abbasid house, um, paying for science for religious reasons or for personal reasons, and that uh, slowly and gradually led to the Renaissance in, in Europe. Um, that happened. Now, it might not have happened in the House of Wisdom. It may be something, to even if you look at the flip side of it, it's much bigger than the House of Wisdom. So can you at least reiterate that the greatness of, of the translation movement, uh, the greatness of the, of the introduction of paper to, to uh, Arab and Muslim civilization and uh, the impact um, on Western civilization, um, that, that, does not, um, that is not reduced by the fact that a lot has been attributed to the House of Wisdom. So yes, it's not the House of Wisdom per se, it's something much bigger. And that's why my of concern course, is that people... this is yeah. not a point of, con of contradiction at all. I, I agree what you said. And this is, for instance, I like very much Dr. Jim Khalili's book because he explains this very well. And I have advised my students and former, former students and colleagues to study this book or to teach this book to their students. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Hassan. My name is Mohammed Abdullah, Senior Lecturer in Arabic Studies at the University of Westminster. My question is quick and straightforward. You know, it was actually the uh, tradition of uh, sultans, rulers, and even scholars to dedicate their books as works of, uh, set on certain medallions and colleges. Do we have any record of books that uh, are part of the waqf? of Bayt al-Hikmah? Good question, and the answer is very simple. This was, Bayt al-Hikmah was a royal palace, royal library attached to the palace under the immediate authority of the caliph. This is one point. Second point, the ahkam al-awqaf, the, the rules of jurisprudence, was not developed yet to cover such an activity. It takes a long, long way to go to until Maraga, Maraga Observatory. I have a long article on this. Actually, this book of uh, Bayt al-Hikmah was the beginning, it's the beginning of a series of monograms on the Dar al-Hikmah, then B. Maristans, then uh, observatories, how the uh, the rules of work of endowments develop to cover activities because when work started it was only for religious activities and it for madrasas not for bimaristan or rasad hana or anything like this we are short of time, but am I allowed to do a question? <clears throat> Just a quick one, probably a principal one, Professor. So two questions really uh, remain in my mind. The first one being is that, you know, you said that uh, we have exhausted all the resources. Do we leave a bit of reserve as to 
for the resources that hasn't shown up yet. We know that the Islamic heritage is quite, so we leave a bit of... Uh, and the second question is, uh, would this loop or should this loop apply for many other libraries that were pro probably as mythical as this, uh, like the Alexandria li Library? Uh, how, what would be the approach of such, or the Greek libraries that we don't have, probably not at all resources uh, re related to that, but yet they exist, the myth about them exists, and they are considered as the predecessors of such big libraries. What is the approach in this regard? The point is, we will always be happy to discover certain manuscripts which can tell us more about this institution and others. But it seems to be that, to me, that this is a controversy created by 19th century, early 20th century scholars when they found something like this and very attractive, Beit al Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, etc. They were happy to find such a thing and reflect their own scholarly ambitions or national ambitions, etc. Of course, a new discovery of a manuscript which we haven't seen, haven't known, will be a great addition. My questioning was built on already existing, existing and some which I uh, found for the first time. The last two examples of Harun Rashid and uh, Mamun and the reading the books for them, etc. And that clarify many things, answer many questions. Uh, the second point, which is... The myth about the other libraries there. Of the course, the big myth about Alexandria. And there are many studies about this, but uh, it is out of context, out of context. Okay, at the end of this lecture, may you join me in thanking uh, our professor for this insightful and interesting lecture. Thank you so much, professor. A uh, big thank you to Alfred Khan team for preparing uh, this event tonight, and especially the IA for putting everything together. And thank you to all of you, uh, really. Thank you for being with us tonight, and to look forward to see you in our future events. Thank you so much for your patience and for, your, uh, for coming tonight. Thank you, and have a good uh, evening.